Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. The Second World War tends to be looked at as a black and white war, both from the footage and the imagery that has survived through to the ideals, a very good versus evil conflict. Yet, throughout a lot of it, we tend to see the white experience amplified, and it can be hard to look at the experience of other people who, frankly, don't look like me. That's where today's guest comes in, because I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by John Conker, who is a postgraduate student at King's College London, looking at the history of the British Empire. And he's looking at the black experience of the RAF during the Second World War, which is fascinating. So I'm delighted to say that he joins us today, and we have an in-depth conversation about what it was like for West African and Caribbean volunteers within the RAF, because it wasn't easy. We're going to be looking at race, we're going to be looking at some of the unwritten rules that were in place to stop men and women of colour from volunteering to do their bit. So without further ado, we're going to get cracking, but please be ready that we will be discussing things that some people might find uncomfortable, and we're going to be discussing that as well. My dear John, <laughs> yes. um, I think that'll stay in. This is a fascinating subject to look at. And as a p- pasty faced, white, middle aged, middle class sort of bloke, I tend to have always looked at the Second World War as a black and white war that increasingly we tend to just see the white of it. When we look at the black experience of it, it's, you know, we we were talking about the the masses of the air thing, you know, it's, it's Tuskegee, isn't it? It's that's, that's the black experience of war that's palatable. When you start your look at it from, from your viewpoint, how do you get drawn into this? And what are some of the the tricky bits that we come up against with the narrative that we're so used to? I think it's this thing, which is history, especially pop history and the, popular and study of history is really difficult to do the nuance and all history is nuanced it's all complicated and messy and any historian or any person with anything more than a cursor in his history will tell you that's the really cool bit is when it gets nuanced and for me as well this is a non-visual format as somebody of mixed race origin of west indian heritage and there's there's a video version of it as well, if you let me use oh, it, yeah. so people can yeah. see you. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> your lovely cardigan. They'll see the cardigan <laughs> and all the non Second World War stuff behind me, but that's fine. <laughs> it, it's fine. We'll, we'll plug the, the podcast for which all of that is for later. <laughs> yeah. But for me, I got into this because being growing up in Britain, you're surrounded by the Second World War. Oh. And for a lot of people of all ages, a lot of that connection, especially when you're young, and growing up is about putting yourself in that place. Mm-hmm. And that's hard when you're not part of, you know, the, the to be very controversial, the white war. You assume that some of that's just part of the course. That's just the cost of being the children, the child of an immigrant, growing up in just an emulsion culture. But as I grew up, you sort of begin to realize through little hints and ticks that that's not true. And, you know, you, hear, you get stories in Black History Months about people like Ulrich Cross and Johnny Smythe and these figures who represent uh, the Black British service in very individual ways. And this is, that's great. And I'm sure we'll talk about Cross later. You can't not. He was mm-hmm. incredible. But the more and more I went into it and got into it as a kid, I was like, oh, this is a fun fact. I did the research website and shows it. You realize that their service is part of a larger story of the empire and parts of the empire like the West Indies and West Africa having a much closer relationship to Britain and the war effort and the Second World War as an event than the popular narrative likes to perceive because also that participation in the Second World War is a lot more complicated because for us you have Britain alone or the empire alone against Nazism and fascism but to a West Indian or a West African you have participation for or against the imperial project 
while also fighting fascism, which is really complicated. It's so complicated that it's just sometimes people just don't want to talk about it. And you get this, you know, with the Tuskegee Airmen, with African Americans in uniform, with the Indian Army in Burma or in Italy. This is an aspect of the Second World, especially Britain's Second World War, that people kind of don't want to talk because it's just really messy. And nobody comes out of it very well. And just just on it. that, is it messy in one direction? Is it messy because it breaks the, the narrative that we're used to, that you know, the films of the 50s and 60s were pushing across? Is that why it's messy? Because it's perceived? Or is it messy because of those added elements of end of empire, independence movements, that side of it as well? It's, I think it's messy for sort of three reasons. One, you have the creation of the post-war memory of the Second World War, which I think a lot more people, although a lot more qualified, talk, to, talk about than me. There's a second element, which is that end of empire, and that people don't... Suddenly, this British world, this great British world, is no longer a great British world. And by the time people are starting to think more about the social memory of the Second World War in the 1960s and 70s, the idea of an imperial war is kind of a bit... People are quite skeptical of it, very declinist about it. The idea that people want to participate in the defense of an empire that was already on the way out isn't popular. And then the third point is that in these countries, service on behalf of the empire is frowned upon for extremely obvious reasons. If you are a Jamaican, Trinidadian, Ghanaian, Nigerian veteran of the Second World War, you have medals with the king's face on it in countries that are trying to develop a, a national self-identity, a national political identity that is opposed to what that medal with the king represents and the imperial power that represents. So those, I mean, um, Mark Johnson made this point rather well in a couple of podcasts he's done that you just, it was just, for his family at least, considered quite unfashionable. And beyond unfashionable, sometimes dangerous because did those medals mean that you supported the continuation of imperial rule or did they simply mean you were proud of your service or were those the same thing? And what you then get into is the memory gap, which, you know, so much of the Second World War's place in our minds is based on social memory and oral history, in that if you're a British or American of a certain age, you will have learned about the Second World War from your parents talking about it, or your parents' parents talking about it, or, you know, the fact that everyone experienced it, they want to tell you about it. And if not... It came out of the, for historians, came the ability to go and talk to people, to interview people in their waning years and to gather these stories down in a way that is much easier in a country that venerates that kind of service politically than the country which is suspicious of it. But also in a country where historians don't really want to talk about it. I'm not, this is the point, is that those trends are not universal. There are there's been some great projects on Caribbean memory and Caribbean memory of the Second World War done by Caribbean historians. But compared to the scale of generational memory that's, was, that has been preserved in America and in Britain and even in Germany and Russia, it's tiny. I think James, James Killing Ray, fabulous book about Af African military service. And the introduction to that is literally him talking about doing this documentary about the African regiments in Burma and then receiving kilos and kilos of bags and bags of letters from all across Africa, from Ghana, from Kenya, from Uganda, from Nigeria, from all these people who had listened to all the world's service and went, that's my story, and put it in. So the possibility of this memory exists. It's just if you are writing in, if you're a British historian, it's not part of your narrative because the social narrative, you're still working as Britain alone. But also to be much zero in some senses, it's not the story you're trying to tell. You, an imperial story of Britain's service on a social level, I mean, he's digging into asking questions like, did a African volunteer sign up willingly? Was the RAF fair to black volunteers? Did it treat them fairly after the war? 
why are there more of the RAS than there were in the army? It, it brings up lots of very messy questions about how Britain thought about race at the time, which makes people uncomfortable and should make them uncomfortable. And if you feel discomforted by conversations like this, it means that your head's in the right place because you're thinking about it properly. I think this is the thing. It makes talking about it sometimes makes people uncomfortable, quite frankly. If you're reading about race policy and you're like, this makes me really feel quite ill. Good. Don't feel like you shouldn't feel uncomfortable. Uh, I shouldn't read history. It makes me uncomfortable. If you're reading about how Britain feels with the empire and you're going, oh, I don't like how this, this feels insane or this makes me feel quite grim. Good. Think about that and keep reading. Let's make some people uncomfortable, shall we? Yeah, go on. <laughs> I've got nothing else planned for this. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Let's take a look at what the feeling was when war broke out. So so what was the situation, let's say, in the Caribbean to start with? When well, things started going terribly wrong in 1939, was there a rush to join up as there was in, in, in other places? Or was there a more nuanced reaction to the news? Nuance is probably the best word. I think it's, it's really fascinating that, like, the, the Caribbean of the 30s is sort of almost in many senses like a canary in the coal mine for what's wrong with the British Empire. And we know about India. We know mm. by the 30s, everybody knows India has boiled over and it's going to go. But the Caribbean is this sort of canary for the whole imperial project in that for most people that are standing in the Caribbean as part of the British Empire, it's the triangle trade, it's slavery, it's the abolition of slavery, and then that possibly is it. But slavery ends, and for basically the Caribbean suddenly becomes goes to be the most lucrative part of the empire to one of the poorest, simply because there's no reason to invest money in it when India and China is there. And this is the true all the way to the end of the First World War. And in the First World War, there is a massive recruitment drive in the West Indies because they, they want to take advantage of the imperial manpower. And they do or they don't in the sense that they recruit huge number of the West Indians into the army and then they don't treat them very well and there's a mutiny. And even those who don't mutiny in Italy at the end of the war go back discontented, feeling betrayed by the imperial government and Versailles. And there were strikes and riots in 1919, 2021. Flash forward to the 1930s and the Great Depression, this sort of discontent has boiled into a general feeling that the British cannot be trusted to run West Indian interests in a way that had kind of been... I, this is the point. You can say grudgingly accepted, but it's difficult to tell because these aren't democracies. You can't find out what people think because most of these places are crown colony governments, which means that there's one man and he makes all the rules and he's appointed in London. And if they possibly have any local leadership, the franchises are... 10% of the population is essentially the white, the money the plant to white population, possibly some of the richer mixed race communities, but it's small. So we don't know what the people think until the mid 30s when there is a wave, what is officially termed West Indies disturbances, but it's best described as a series of extremely violent strikes and riots and protests, which end in the, the army and the navy being deployed to the West Indies, to places like Trinidad and Jamaica, uh, people being shot, people fleeing. And it is this massive protest against British, mis British misrule. I think this is the interesting because it's never phrased in terms of we want the British out and to become independent at this point. It's more that the British cannot govern us as part of the British Empire. We have to govern ourselves within this imperial system. There are people who want the Brits out, but it's still very much this mass demonstration that the imperial project isn't working and in conjunction with that you have mass protest against the italians and this is where the second world war sort of interest in the west indies begins to sort of make a bit more sense because you have on one hand this massive violent in some cases outrage and anger at british misrule and on the other hand you have equal levels of violence and anger against fascism because in, especially by the time the 20s and 30s, there's a burst of concepts called, such as Pan-Africanism, which is essentially the birth point of a lot of modern black African-American, Afro-Caribbean and African political thinking. The core of it is a belief in the African self and, of course, black self-government. 
and that goes to Ethiopia. And as uh, many of you listeners will know, in 1935, Ethiopia suddenly becomes a lot less independent and a lot more full of Italian soldiers. And there is, you know, it, in the West Indies, there are riots attacking Catholic churches and Italian shopkeepers and Italian expats. People want to volunteer. A Trinidadian stunt flyer goes and flies through the Ethiopian Air Force. He's mad. I've completely forgotten his name, but he is. This guy is mad. He doesn't. He is banned from serving the British forces because um, he seems pretty unreliable in the sense that he challenged Herman Goering to a man-to-man fighter duel over the English Channel. And then <laughs> um, after that, basically, he's trying to sell his services to the Italian Air Force, having short. It's, it's, he's insane. Yeah. It, it, um, the, well, to, to 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 be fair, most most of it most of Italy's foreign policy about this time is insane as well. And yeah. it's the, the, I, I was fortunate enough to work in Ethiopia for a while and being taken out for an Italian lunch on my first day, I did find a little bit strange. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but, but in the Caribbean, in a way that, you know, we, I mean, it's, it's true. Is it not? I'm not really an expert on the social dynamics of anti-trashism in England, but from what I've read, people, seem to understand what fascism means more in the West Indies. Yeah. In two ways. One, because they obviously do it in the news, it's in the press, and two, because when you hear, you read books and you hear descriptions of things like of the Nuremberg laws and seg- and social segregation Nazi Germany and talk of oppression, if you are the descendant of slaves or a subject of the imperial crown, it is not dissimilar. It's not the same thing. But it, it's not it's not a foreign concept. And the idea that that kind of rule could happen is very tangible. Because these are people, especially in the United States, who know what it means to have your civil liberties curtailed and have the, uh, the military curtail your ability to be in public and to express yourself. See, this is a really complicated position. When war breaks out, there are a lot of West Indian radicals and journalists who don't or basically don't fight a white man's war and that is quite that is common as a colloquialism why are we fighting this war but at the same time there's still this feeling that the mother country is being attacked and if the germans beat it life for us will go from defeatable misery to an absolute nightmare you know basically they know how to beat the british they know how to work with the British. They know how to survive in that system. Whereas in a lot of people in the Caribbean and in Africa look at the Nazis and go, they're going to come and kill, they will just kill us all. That is that is a motivation of one part, but there is no patriotic movement to fight British insertion because that's just not where the, well, that's not where the world is in 39. Every, much like, the, much like the, met, the metropole of Britain itself, war in 39 is met with sort of horror apathy and sort of like i guess i'm doing this again the only sort of big moment is um grash bay there's a big freak out when it looks like grash bay is going to go into caribbean but then she doesn't and goes she goes south and stem river play and you know that whole that and that doesn't end well for grash bay. bay no but the, the real turning point in all of this is a fall of France, because suddenly it makes possibly Britain being defeated more tangible, but it also changes Britain's attitude to its empire, its manpower pool, because Britain does not want to repeat the First World War and how it relied on a lot of non-British manpower, because in its head, what it did was take, it radicalised a large amount of the male population and sent them home and made them politically dangerous. So they don't want to do that. Even though by May and June, there are big pushes for West Indian service. There's been a lot of people from the West Indies or West Indian origin in Britain who tried to join up and have been told they're not allowed to because the army and the air force and the navy still have, for lack of a better phrase, an informal, unmentioned color bar. How does that adjust, though? So if, if we're talking sort of 1940 fall of France, how how do you remove an unwritten, unmentioned color bar? Is it you know in somebody's club saying, "Oh, my dear chap, we we need we need more." So well, it's like it's like them them <laughs> lost over them. <laughs> in, well, it, it hits, so there has been no league. There's no law 
putting an emergency color bar, right? It's not like in the United States, where there is a color bar put in law in government service. It is more that in the King's regulations for all three services, there is basically a clause saying that you can't allow personnel who are not of pure European descent, right? And that this is the point is that because Britain is not a country like the United States in the 1930s and 40s, which has very formal rules of reg- racial segregation, like the one drop rule, what exactly pure European descent means is up to whoever is standing in front of you, which means that it's very easy to just say the rule doesn't work, we're at war, we'll ignore it. Okay. So basically what happens is, if I can find the right note, at the beginning of the war, the, uh, the war office tells the colonial office, we must keep up, the formal quote is, we must keep up the fiction of there being no colour bar. Only those with special qualifications are likely to be accepted. So they're basically saying, we don't want to admit we have one, but we have one. And then it's broken in England because Harold Moody, who is a big civil rights activist for what the League of Colored Peoples, which, for lack of a better way to explain it, is the closest British equivalent to the NAAC, the NAACP at the time, is doing the same sort of civil rights in the 1740s. His sons try to join the army, and his sons are South of public school boys. So, you know, they are the absolute perfect cream of the crop you'd want to be That's in like the army. T- ticking every box except one. Except one, which is that they're not white. They went to Imperial The oldest one went to Imperial College, for Christ's sake. It's like, I think. <laughs> I might be, but, like, he went to Allied and Imperial. So it's like he is, he couldn't be more public schoolboy officer than that. But they say, no, you can't go in. And when the press find this and the left-wing organizations find it, they kick up an obvious fuss. And um, they basically, the war office folds because they don't have a leg to stand on because they don't have a legal color bar. They've, been, they've spent up, over a decade now pretending they don't have one. And they're fighting a war, in their own words, to destroy, segregate, to destroy discriminatory legal systems. So even in 1939, they're counting the war and we are, not, we, we are fighting against Nazi fascist systems. So they can't, they just basically fold immediately, but they maintain the rules for the empire. So much so that even as May, February, May, February ish, 1940, there's a letter from a white Jamaican plant, um, like Magaday, to London going, basically, going, why is it that I can serve, but all of my fellow nationals who are black can't, even though they want to go? And it's, you know, there's a great quote here, which is, what of, what of many West Indians of like means and views who have mixed or Negro descent? Surely there is a place for us all in this battle for civilization. And that's the attitude of everyone. Even Churchill turns to the war office in June 1940, it's like, we should raise a West India regiment. And the army goes, no. <laughs> so it's like, raise a three battalion regiment. There's a, there is a petition from Trinidad to send 25,000 people to England. There's a riot in Jamaica because they want to fight. And the army says no, and the navy says even worse. So it's only the and but it's the RAF that lets them through. And there's basically two reasons for this. The RAF is suddenly going to have to expand its size. Because the RAF is basically well, you I expect your listeners and you're probably more informed to be on how this strategy works. The Orioles did not expect to be fighting the war it ends up fighting after 1940. Mm, in that scale, as quickly. I think the quote I have is in 19, beginning of 1940, they are expected to have to add 96,000 more personnel at minimum. And that's before the full fronts. So yeah. suddenly it's got to, go for, got to go from very small to very large. It's been ramping up, but they, as with the army, they think there's a French buffer and that they've got time. And suddenly that time is yeah. gone. Sorry to interrupt. That's just throwing in for, for that new listener who just joined midway through our yeah. conversation. <laughs> okay. But this is the thing is that, well, the Air Force doesn't have the institutional like barriers in the sense of there is not a Colonel Blimp, the regiment going, you would dishonor the regiment to let these people in. There's not a feeling that it would dis, it would break the traditions of the army, especially in Britain which did not have a tradition of colonial military service. It's not France. It's not even America. Because, you know, America has 
So that what are known as Buffalo Soldier, they have traditions of segregated military service in the colonial period. Britain does Britain doesn't outside of the Indian Army, which is not as the great Robert Lyman will tell you, it's not the British Army, it's the Indian Army. There is not a tradition of colonial military service. Even the West India regiments are largely contrivances. Before the First World War, they're mainly formed of freed slaves, which is not a homegrown colonial sense, it's much more complicated. But the RAF doesn't have these institutional barriers. And also culturally, if the RAF can go, we will take, we will only take the best. And there will be racial definitions around the best there, but they can say it and mean it in the sense that that's just how the RAF always operate. That's how it operated when it got really small during the interwar periods. So the idea that we're just gonna let the shit hog candidates through from wherever they come from is not new to them. But also, there's a lot of people in the colonial office who really, really want this because they understand the social importance of service, especially for a very the patriotic West Indian middle class. Is that this is really important to them. And if these are the people you kind of are angling to run the country in 30 years, you need them to buy into this great struggle for civilization and not have them shut out of it. It's the same issue, it's the same reason that SD, around the same time, actually, you have the March of Washington and then an FDR bends and lets in black workers in was that 41? That might be 41. I'm get- it's a bit later, isn't it? It's it's a, it's after the arsenal of democracy. Speech. Yeah, so it's, it is yeah. 41, I'm thinking, some of 41. But it's the same principle that you have to give this flag like colonial community a buy-in to the project. And so the RAF, I think, if you give me a minute, I think I actually have the paper where the RAF gives in. Yeah, here we go. This is the first letter I... The first official mention I can find of colonial recruitment for the Royal Air Force for air crew and skilled trains is the 24th of May. Actually, oh, wow. yeah, which is earlier than I remember the being. It is 24th of May, 1940. Well, at the beginning of the war, a letter goes around to all the colonial departments, embassies of consulates saying, take take white recruits. If a non-white part of the cover, turn them away, but you can take white recruits. And this is a letter here basically saying, we're going to waive that in the West Indies and Malaya, which is fascinating. And this, is the letter, no, this one, second one I've got here, is from the... Air Ministry to the Colonial Office saying, here are some copies of the medical, of the RAS medical requirements, send them to the West Indies. But I will know these are pre-war medical things. Because so from this point op- on, the RAS is open to non-white recruits from the colonies. And I be very specific about that because there's a couple of West Indians who I have picked up who are in serving squadrons in 41 and 42 who must have been resident in Britain and have signed up that way. Because most it's, of the West Indian recruits are coming through end of 40, beginning of 41, going through the Canadian Air Training Scheme or domestic training and aren't seeing service till 42 or later. Just time time frames. It's too quick for them to get on, e- even if they had some flying experience beforehand. Yeah, so they must be... But some of these guys must have been resident in England after the color bars dropped at the end of that 39 comes through that way. But all of that does come largely down to connections to social perceptions. You know, there's one of the guys I follow is a Jamaican lawyer by the name of Victor Tucker. He was a solicitor and he's with a 129 Squadron from mid-41 through. And there's a J.A. Marichaud, Trinidadian, who joins 602 Squadron in, in mid-42, who we are tests in England in June 41. But then I also know of a, there's a chorus, fascinating correspondence with a Barbadian man living in Edinburgh who is who was turned away three times from recruiting stations. Despite having a letter from, him, from the colonial office saying he's allowed to be recruited, they fl- they are, he was still turned away. So it's very much that English, that very British thing of, do you know somebody? Are you of the right class? You're in. And this is that is also reflected in the makeup of the West Indian volunteers because they are largely of the West Indian middle and upper class. They are public school boys. They all know each other. They all go to school with each other. On these islands, that's not difficult. But, you know, they're teachers' children, they're civil servants, they're doctors, 
the people who, barring pe- a few exceptions like Billy Strachan, most of them are the professional class. And even Billy Strachan was absolutely much smarter than everyone else around him for his entire life. So, so we're, we're seeing a strata getting into the RAF through this. And what happens to them when they get in? Are, first off, are they accepting what we would term WAFs as well? Were, were women being accepted? Or was it just educated men to go into aircrew operational ground roles? I have not found evidence of any WAFs. I think most West Indian women who do end up in Britain in uniform are in the ATS or the auxiliary army or in the Women's Land Army. There's a very famous case in 43 where a West Indian woman resident in London is refused um, by the, the, the military agriculture refuses to allow her to join the Land Army. And it causes so much public outrage that basically she's got she's getting letters through her door from farmers going, I'd like you to come and work for me. Because people people are it's this fascinating thing where people are genuinely outraged that the government wouldn't let British subjects fight for their country. Cause that's the that is how the public understand this in many sense. It's like yeah. people are very disjointed views about empire and what empire means and who actually lives in it. But you push into the line of these things politically. People view the people view a lot of imperial subjects as British people when they want to. When it comes to doing one's bit, I suppose. Yeah. In the highest British tradition, of course, it's doing one's bit, and then why are you still here afterwards? Yes. But when it comes <laughs> to um, coming through, it once again it is all very dependent on who you are, how you volunteered and the authorities that are running the process. So Auric Cross, for example, basically he, he got a lot of recommendation from his teacher to go to give to the RAF officer. It suddenly meant he was in because he had a recommendation that from a person of authority and it, it was all sort of plain sailing. Billy Strachan had to make his own way to London via Liverpool. And when he went famously, his famous story was he walked up to the RAF I come the RAF office and said, I'd like to join the RAF. And the door sergeant told the fuck off. <laughs> All piss off, depending on how, who you are. And when they started the fight, the desk officer put his head out and went, oh, no, you can't join up here. You have to go to the recruiting office down the road, which they then did and attested. So in the Caribbean, there was a lot of support, generally, for service, whether from the government or from local magnates who... So them doing their bit was sponsoring young men to go. So you have the you have two Trinidad, you know, Trinidadian contingents, Barbadian contingents, uh, so Asian contingents, where the community, or specifically the big local magnates, are using their wealth to fund their trips because you have to pay your way to England or Canada. The government's not going to pay that, so you have to pay to get where you're going. So the hoops aren't just unwritten rules, finding the right recruitment office. It's making your way to those places. So it's not a case of an an, an office in in Trinidad or or Kingston or something like that where you can walk in, sign up, and they put you on a boat ready to go for not in Not in 41 and 42. There's a brief, there's a period between 43 and 44 when they think, when they are basically preparing for an all-out bomb of war till the end of 45 where they do do formal recruitment like that in the West Indies, but they don't do it for very long. But generally, it is very much, you have to find, you have to jump hoops in the system. And the West Indies, it's difficult, but it's achievable. And the West African authorities essentially decide to not, to not let anyone through, because in West expensive. Africa, it's, no, it doesn't do with the expense. They can afford it. It's much, it's much more simple than that, which is in, it's much more of a threat than social order. The West Indies have had, for lack of, to be quite frank, a racial political system for 300 years by 1939. 300-ish years. It is a social structure in which the power dynamics are different. There's still a lot of race involved. There's still very much racial barriers, but it's a lot more subtle. And it's a, it, and the position of 
West Indians and Black West Indians in uniform is not considered a threat to the social order. That, in the sense that their plate by the thirties, their placement, their firemen, their civil servants, not a lot, but they are, and that's not, that's not a threat to the political order. In Africa, it is because in in Ghana, in Sierra Leone, in Nigeria, positions of allowing black men to wear British military uniforms and command the respect that a British officer, British officer or NCO in uniform would have is considered politically dangerous. Because you've built a stratified society and by allowing these people, basically it's a, the, these, a lot of these colonial governments don't end up a situation where a white man would have to salute a black man. They just don't want to go near that because they, they just think it's going to cause chaos. And it, it will certainly cause chaos of their own order. But so they basically, it's not even that they make the personal jump through hoops. It's more that they set the hoops on fire and then throw them into a lake full of oil and say, you got to climb through that. Hmm. Maybe not utterly unten untenable. It is. Well, here's the point, which is that the, the, gov the clothing office and the air ministry basically say, you need to get us this many recruits and then discover that some of the colonial governments aren't even telling people that they can join up. <laughs> um, in the period that they have small recruiting in West Africa, which is really small, it is basically a bit at the end of 1940, all of 41, and a little bit of 42, but it's not very long. Nigeria rejects all 572 volunteers based on education and medical restrictions. That's nice. Pre-war education and medical restrictions. And that includes malaria, right? Any contact with malaria. And it's like, you can, like you can, I can understand the argument, but also you are asking the population of Nigeria in the, in the 1940s, have you had malaria at any point? They're going, but also, and the education ones are quite deliberately higher than they would be. But it's, it gets to points where um, people are finding any way they can to go. So see, the, Johnny Smythe, Sierra Leone, is so good, they can't find an excuse to reject him. So him and five others from Sierra Leone go, along with four from the Gold Coast, one day Ghana, one from Gambia. Um, but then Paul Foster Jones, who's also Sierra Leone, wasn't allowed to go. So he um, did the sensible thing, which is he made his way to Lagos, got on a boat to England as a stevedore, and then went from Liverpool to the colonial office and complained. He went to speak to the colonial minister. He was like, I should be allowed to do it. I could pass all the tests, and they refused me on a, on a technicality. That's ridiculous. And the colonial ministry just went, yeah, okay, fine. And he was, um, what's the word? He enlisted as an engineer. Because the other part of this is that the colonial office is really, really keen to get these guys in uniform. They consider it good for the development of the empire, for the, you know, to be very 1940s about it, for the development of that of the development of the race, which yeah. I don't know what that means. I don't think they knew what it meant to either. So but they're very much for imperial participation in the war. And the RAF is reasonably key. It's the colonial governments who really don't want to allow this transgression. And this has affects the rest of the war and things like West Indian and West African personnel are not allowed to be based in airfields and air stations in West Africa or in the Caribbean because they will be more violent. They're not allowed to be stationed anywhere that have contact with South African troops because there are fights. And this goes all the way after the war in that a lot of these pilots end up doing transport command flying guys home. And they're like, you've got to be really careful where you send them. Even though we can't afford to get rid of them, but we've got to be really careful. But this is the thing. So you have all these hoots and all these deliberate and subtle attempts to pass people out and to not let them through. And you still get about 10,000 people who just do it. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. <laughs> Here we're at the Pima Air and Space Museum uh, in our Hangar 5 uh, which, with more World War II aircraft. And the aircraft behind us is a consolidated PB4Y2 privateer, which was a Navy patrol bomber derived from the consolidated B-24 Liberator. Um, as you notice, there's massive differences between this and the Liberator. The fuselage looks kind of the same, 
it's actually an extended fuselage because there's more crew um, we need for like radar operators and um, and other additional crew members that were on the Navy patrol aircraft. Uh, it also did not have superchargers on the engines because they didn't fly at higher altitudes like the B-24 did, which also allowed them to rotate the engines 90 degrees. You also notice it has a single tail um, versus the twin tail on the B-24. Uh, the other thing that's interesting with this aircraft too is just its armament loadout is a little bit more. It has two top turrets. It has a uh, nose turret, tail turret, and two actual powered side turrets. Um, they were essentially used for patrol bombing, which would be, you know, searching for and attacking Japanese shipping and Japanese submarines, um, as well as bombing Japanese held islands. This aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew out of the Aleutian Islands for the last few months of the war, um, doing patrol missions uh, over northern Japan and bombing the Kuril Islands north of Japan that have, are a series of islands that have always kind of been contested between Russia and the Japanese. Uh, a bunch of privateers were modified after the war as fire bombers. They were given different engines and then ha usually had their guns all taken off and were heavily modified to fight fires. Um, they were using them up until I think about the early 2000s when they started retiring them because of like um, metal fatigue and issues that they're having with the aircraft, uh, you know, that had been flying for 50 years plus in also very bad environments. But I've always thought this is a pretty unique aircraft. It's one of the only, this is the only privateer currently on display that has been modified back into its patrol bomber variant with the proper engines and all the turrets and all the radar and antennas on it. Um, so externally, this looks like it did in 1945 when it was uh, fine combat. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. Let's start digging into some of these experiences because, yeah. We've mentioned Johnny Smythe, who I think has got the best officer photo ever. Johnny, he couldn't, he couldn't look any cooler, really. I am picture. Johnny. The thing, actually, I'll be quite frank. If all the pictures, of course, the other thing, if they took huge of ass propaganda pictures and footage of these guys, you know, so I think Johnny Smythe must be the most photographed before he gets shot down. Must be the most photographed RAF officer in the country. But also, I would invite your all the viewers and listeners to Google Johnny Smythe and look at him because. They were all shit hot, but there were always people trying to catch them out, especially in the air training scheme. Um, both Dudley Thompson and um, Errol Barrow end up doing their air training, I think, in Canada, the, um, for the air training scheme. And there is an incident, I think it's with Thompson, where they talk, where um, basically they're trying to catch them out on algebra. It's like, oh, you can't do basic algebra. I'll have to put you in the dunce class, basically. We'll have to pass you out. And then he's... Um, the 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 structure's put in the calculation up on the board. And he just stands up. John Thompson stands up and finishes it on the board for him, and puts the answer up. And the instructor sort of looks at him, and it's like, well, and it's like, okay, sit down. And then he's just part, he's passed straight through the course immediately. Because they all assume that these guys are, you know, from basic reasons, not as smart as them. Even though you are looking at the some of them are shit hot people not just in like possibly in, in the British Empire because they have to be because yeah. you have to be good you can't make a mistake in this system because well the one mistake you make will reflect not just on you but on everyone who looks like you and this is exactly what happens and we'll get to it with Owen oh, Sylvester later because Sylvester is a really important example of how one I think one man changes the entire policy which is insane but most of these guys Look no, I, I was going to say, because this is bringing up photos was my backdoor way of working my man, Jellico Schoon, into the conversation here. Uh, who, Jellico, yes. Who is, he, he's a bit of a boy, um, but he's probably in the most reproduced image of a black RAF, not officer at the time, was he? He was a flight Oh, the, yeah. But the picture of, of him in front of Big Ben. Yes. And... The, I find that fascinating because, you know, the, 
as I've spoken to you about in the past, the rumors about him, because it's, it's hard to track down his, his actual story. He, he, the reason I like him, he ends up on typhoons, lady and gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's, that's involved, a spoiler. Isn't he, he's involved in the, um, accidental sinking of the, what's it called? What is it? The, um, Cap Arcona. The Cap he's, Arcona. Yeah. yeah that, it, there's, he, he he's shot down best. on it. Yeah. He, is he? Yeah. He, he gets okay. hit by flak and, um, has a glycol leak and walks home. Which, to be fair, isn't that far at that point because they're no. already in Hamburg. Yeah, yeah that's not too bad. I mean, I mean you, you sort of have to imagine the you know the poor squaddies of the poor squaddies of Twenty First Army Group is like, who the fuck's that? <laughs> 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 and I like but, him because apparently the 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 other rumor is he liked playing loud music. So you know, what's not? Oh, he liked. Play, that's one rumor I've heard. The other one, of yeah. course, is that the reason he got transferred to the Typhoon Squadron was that he, he he got caught buzzing his girlfriend's house in a Spitfire. Yeah. That, yeah. So the point is that yeah. is unsub and it's completely unsubstantiated. There's no ex there's no proof that he did it. No. But it's it's a good it's a good story. Because, but, but, but that re I'm just sort of if we, we delve into the that, that photograph for a second, because even now as soon as sort of Black History Month pops up, I see that photo everywhere out of context because it's often you know, with the wrong caption, often saying it's from yeah. the wrong island, often saying yeah. it's somebody else. Yeah. It's become representative. And it's that thing, it's like because it's become so representative, it becomes easier to act like they weren't, they weren't involved in combat duty and they weren't, they didn't just fall into the units like other men. Because the RAS is. A completely polyglot institution by 42, 43. You know, it's people like Aura Cross in the past finders. He's going up with South Africans, Czechs, Poles, you know, um, some Americans, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, you name it, because that's just how the RAS is. It's full of other people. It's full of people who aren't British, because that's just how they're running it. So, the I, you know, it's not, especially in the RAS, you just kind of got on with it. If if you if you're good enough and you can keep keep your yeah you know, in the case of crosses because bring bring back the guy sitting next to him, it's uh, well cross it's, was it's unbelievably popular. I mean it was mm. the sort of thing where even when he even before he was squadron leader and lead navigator, people were like, "I want cross in my plane because I'll get us back." But the other funny cross story is um, he got his commission because he he won a six mile. Um, Long distance run at navigation school. And the CEO brought him in to say congratulations. And then went Dino Larry Constantine. Constantine, to be correct. And um, <laughs> for those of you who are Jim Holland and massive cricket fans, Larry Constantine is probably the most famous West Indian of the 40s. He is a star Yorkshire cricketer. He is a radio broadcaster. And at this time, he is the lead West Indian citizen in England. He is going up and down the country acting on behalf of West Indian workers and West Indian servicemen, and also still being a star cricketer, doing lots of um, talks around that. But and because Shiradan is this small, Croft did know Constantine. And he tells the CEO he knows Constantine, which seems to impress his CEO because the next day he's promoted to a pilot officer. <laughs> are they, and Croft is like, are these related? I don't know. But well, he's, he's he's working the system like anyone else would. You know? he he walks into the interview with the right tie. He's you know, yeah, yeah. You're away, you? yeah. and you also you work the stereotypes. I mean, the other famous cross story that um, Will Ardale told it is um, past, is it Will Ardale? Oh, past finders? Yeah, that is Will Ardale. Yeah, um, it's a famous one about him and Kendrick Rawlins pretending they're African princes. Yeah, and having the sergeants <laughs> down do their bedding for them. Even though actually there was an actual Nigerian, this is this sounds like a joke, but an, a, a Nigerian prince was a Spitfire pilot, and really? he was quite yeah. I can't remember the name of the God. I, I have it in my notes somewhere. He quite tragically was killed. He had a he was engaged to a local to a local. He was killed in a um. Actually, I'm going to grab the book. Peter Thomas of Lagos, son of an extremely wealthy Nigerian dignitary. The rumor he was um not known as a. Confident as a um, what's the word? Successful flyer. Um, the rumor was that whenever he bent an aircraft, his father would foot the bill. <laughs> but then in January '45, he, he was doing an excellent deal with the Brighton Beacons and had to make a crash landing, and uh, it went quite badly. He um, he was thrown out of the aircraft when it crashed. 
severely injured, but died quite late. Yeah. But yeah, there were a few significant officials because, as they say, it becomes an upper class amongst the colonial upper class because they're the only people with access to the education. And that's very much reflected in the fact that they know more about the world than a lot of the people they're serving with and supposedly coming to fight for. You know, almost all West Indian airmen had a story about being asked, you know, do you have a tail? Do you live in trees? Do you live in coke? Do you, you know, do you um, drink coke in the palm beaches? You know, people didn't know the world that they came from, even though they knew the world they were coming to. There's an apocryphal story about a West Indian airman being asked, um, why are you here when you have um, palm trees in the Caribbean? And he went, you can't eat palm trees. <laughs> but they are absolutely the creep. They are. They have to be shit hot. Because if they make a mistake, it's going to affect not just them, but their entire cadre of airmen and their entire, the perception of their entire community. So much so that essentially there's a long-standing thing where a lot of memorandums say that we can't have West Indian airmen as aircraft captains, that crews react badly and that West Indians, uh, black airmen are untrustworthy as crew captains. And as far as I can work out, it all comes back to a Trinidadian, Owen Sylvester. But Owen Sylvester's squadron commanding officer did not like him. Owen Sylvester told the story of as a warrant officer, being captain of a uh, Lancaster uh, plane captain, and he's the new CO, and um, being they were lined up in front of the aircraft, and they were saluting, and he walks up to the navigator, who is South African, and goes, I suppose you're the captain. And the navigator goes, no, sir, it's um, Sylvester here. And the CO was not amused, and supposedly walked away saying to an aide, I know how to deal with these people. I have experience of dealing with them in India. Hmm. And supposedly the rest of the crew who were all white were like, this is not a good sign. And it was not a good sign because Sylvester's record turns up in the RF records as basically being talking back and not sort of squatting orders and being a nuisance and basically lauding his... They argue basically that he, oh, he, he was not using his powers as a plane captain responsibly, whereas it's kind of possible that the, the, his boss was out for him. Because mm -hmm. you read the letters that Sylvester writes to the air ministry to the state's case, he's basically like, he's got a hint to me, he doesn't like me. But Sylvester is used for the rest of the war as a justification for why you can't have West Indians as aircraft captains, even though they end, a lot of them end up as aircraft captains anyway. Because it's the just the the Yeah, the, the, the necessity, skill, and availability. Yeah. Even that availability question becomes quite weird because, for example, because of incidents in Tunisia and Sicily, no West Indian was sent to the Mediterranean after mid-43. In fact, the Air Council recommends transferring them all to England. This is a quote. There are only three places in the whole wide world where a colored colonial can be at ease and give his best day's work, and they are in his home, in a combat zone where men develop an amazing street of camaraderie and in the British Isles where he is not only respected but also gets the, op the opportunity occasionally to meet his own people in his clubs and hostels. What? Yeah. <laughs> so after it, December 43... So what yeah. had happened in Tunisia to, to create that report? Fights with the Americans and fights with South African personnel. Yeah. So where they come fa face to face with people from overtly racist systems and they push mm -hmm. back against that and it kicks off. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. The other thing, of course, is having told you about that odd letter, it's written by Sergeant J. Rowan Henry, who is a West Indian in the Royal Air Force. That's his recommendation on behalf of his fellow countrymen. I'm glad to see he worked clubs in, because you know, that sort of shows the the level that he's he's thinking at. The importance of the West Indian social clubs is both is understated because considering pa the passive and active segregation present in Britain, whether it's the United States Armed Forces creating segregated spaces for its own purposes or the passive segregation 
that British commercial spaces enforced irregularly. I'd say safe spaces like the uh, the West Indian clubs and hostels in London and Liverpool and Bristol were really important. In which case, I've misunderstood the statement, thinking it was a, a white chap who was writing that letter. No. Now that we know it's the other way, so yeah. this is this is specific social clubs as opposed to clubby club British whites, all, all that sort of jazz. These are more more akin to I don't want to say informal, but they're they're they're, they're set up upon different different means well, they're, the traditional they're, 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 it's the same sort of tradition but it's closer in terms of social basis to something like a working man's club or an expats club they are expats clubs basically and they're really important before the war and they're important after the war in knitting social communities together but and that's the thing of course is that you can be and get on with your people from across the world and your squadron or your plane but when you come off base Life is very different for everyone involved. What What about the crews who were shot down? So, Cross gets shot down. Quite quite, quite a few do. What Cross, What no, is Southern gets shot? Smythe gets shot down. Cross Smythe gets shot down. Yes, so like fifty missions. Cross mm. seems to have managed to survive all of them pretty much intact. But I, I have too many windows open and too many names, and I picked the wrong one. So I'll fix that in the edit. But what? So what? What was the experience like for for those who were in the bag? How did the Germans view them? Germans just don't know what to think of them because, you know, it's that typical German hubris in that, you know, beyond racial politics, assuming that black people are illiterate child. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't, I, don't ha- I shouldn't have to explain to your audience what a Nazi thinks about black people. Hopefully they can put two and two together and figure it out. But so they don't know what to do. When people like Smythe appear out of Barnes or people like Cy Grant are handed over, to the extent that when Cy Grant is handed over to the German authorities in Holland, they basically keep trying to prod him and go, oh, but you must be a propaganda trick or something. You know, you could, the, they aren't watching that. You can tell us what you're really doing. And he's like, I'm, I'm a pilot. I'm bombing you. I'm trying to rid the world of fascism. And he's like, no, you're not. And then he remembers being dragged out into a prison yard and having photographs taken with him with the caption, a British airman of undeterminable race, <laughs> which was the title of Cy Grant's biography. Because they just don't know what to think. So are they propaganda tools? Are they really pilots? Johnny Smythe famously, having been shot down over Mannheim in November 43, um, he hides in a barn, a bunch of German soldiers come and yell for him to come out. And when he comes out, they literally stare at him in shock because he's six, he's a six foot five west african in an RAF uniform and i'm not nine times out of ten i don't think any of these german guys would have seen a, a west african of any kind let alone a six foot five one in an enemy uniform i mean spies is fairly lucky because he nearly gets killed by a mob when those because those german soldiers take him through the town of Mannheim, which he's just bombed mm. and a mob tries to kill him and he has to be dragged away from them which, you, which, to be fair, that that in, in of of itself is something that Phil Blood and I have discussed, possibly talking about the the, the lynchings of Erica on on the ground, which is one of those things that, for someone like Smythe, that must have been terrifying, and I, and all air crew that 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 had to go through. It. But then again, you have ended up in the place you've just dropped a few tons of high yeah. explosives on. Yeah, and in many senses, you read the accounts of a lot of these guys, and they have it's. There's a on the 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 Second World History podcast we shall not name. There's this casual bit about how like ridiculous listening to recording with RAF personnel sound, where it's like steady boys coming over the target. You read these accounts and you're like, you might be from Sierra Leone or Trinidad, but you have the same sort of like practice casual language in the sense that Johnny Spires used to call he just called them the swastika boys. <laughs> um, uh, Cy Grant is very casual but like bemused by how the Germans just can't understand him like they can't understand the concept of these guys a lot but then they, they're officers so they go in the office they go to the POW camps with the rest of the officers and largely do fine um, Tony Spies is on is at Stalin 1 in Pomerania and he's on the escape committee he never, oh, and as, a, as an officer, every time they make an attempt, if 
you could go if you want. And he's like, no, I really probably won't get very far. <laughs> but he's on the escape committee. And, you know, he was an officer, so the German, the German camp guards had to salute him. And they had to see respect. And um, Saigard ends up in Stalingrad 3. Saigard is in Stalingrad 3 when the Great Escape happens, I, if I remember correctly. He might have been, it's either when it happens or just after it happens. But he was very popular because he was a painter. So he, um, everybody wanted him to paint pictures of wives and girlfriends and things. And he exchanged it for lessons because the RES is full of, um, you know, the, the best, brightest and best Britain has. So he's learning, he's being taught by, you know, the cream, how he describes it, the cream of officers, uh, writers, school teachers, lecturers, and scientists, and um, living together for two years together, I learned a great deal and asked a lot of questions. That's where I matured, actually. And is for him, and for a lot of personnel, this experience is when he figures out that Britain cannot be in the West Indies. Because not only is he, he's surrounded by the British elite, who are also like, we should probably get out of the West Indies. He's going to buy a lot of young men his age who don't understand the Imperial Project either. So there's not much to be done. You know, you can't, it's not an argument. All these guys are on the same page about it as him. And, and that's, I think, the, the sort of area that we wanted to sort of end up with is as the war winds up, how does this, we'll call them like officer class for the majority of them, returning back home, what do they take back with them? You, you know, uh, so I was very much for for independence what was there a mix or was it a sort of turbocharging of the movements that would sort of see the islands gain their independence over the next sort of 20 years i have i've described the experience of the war and fighting fascism for the british empire as a laboratory for post-colonialism mm-hmm. in that okay. you not only did you teach them that fascism could be defeated you have a political turn of the war with things like the Atlantic Charter and the Beveridge Report and the election of the Labour government that makes decolonization go from a hypothetical to a reality. And thirdly, you've taken a call of young men and taught them how to lead and put them through the most dangerous experience of their life. A British policeman's truncheon, clothing's truncheon or bayonet, will not seem as dangerous if you've flown 50 missions over Germany. It just won't. So people, especially it feels like people like Cross, I'm like, I will not waste a single moment of my life. But of that core of West, in, of West Indian and West Africans who go and fight, you have four prime ministers, three high commissioners, two high Caribbean high court judges, about a dozen to two dozen lawyers. Among, in, this is, you know, Venn diagram. And nearly a hundred more, hundreds of civil rights activists and politicians who essentially shape what post, the post-colonial Caribbean and post-colonial Africa will look like. So Ora Cross, famously High Commissioner for Trinidad in Britain, he does, takes a bar in London at Temple. He's special counsel to Kwame Nkrumah, first president of Ghana, helps form the legal system of the first independent British colony in Africa. Um, he then does the same in Cameroon and Tanzania. He's the only person to serve as a senior judge in two separate countries on two separate continents. He was advocate general of Cameroon, high court judge in Tanzania, and then a high court judge in Trinidad, like in a row. And then Errol Barrow, who ends up, Errol Barrow not is, he flies bombers. And then he is, Shulton Douglas is personal pilot, when Shulton Douglas is governor of British occupied Germany. So he is Shulton Douglas's children's godfather. So where the Douglases, when Charles Douglas ends up as, I think, chief commissioner, an executive at BOAC, they regularly holiday in Barbados so they can see the Barrows. And Errol Barrow becomes a lawyer, goes into the Barbadian Labour Party, leaves the country of independence. But his RAF service is so important to him that you look at the pictures of Errol Barrow independence, and you should put these up because I've never seen a man, I've never seen a British governor looked more pleased to lose his job. <laughs> Him and Errol Barrow are just having... You look at these pictures of Errol Barrow 
and the governor on Independence Day. Aaron Barrows in his Aria still address. There's that fantastic shot with he's him got with the governor with the, the hands up and yeah. <laughs> but you can see he's got his Barrows. He's got his wings on. Yep, <laughs> that's fantastic. But and but if you look, all Barrows' little portraits are in Aria's tie, and he's buried in the military cemetery. And on his graves, it has his RAF rank above being Prime Minister of Barbados. Because <laughs> it was that important to him. Mm. And then you have others like Dudley Thompson, Jamaican uh, doctor turned uh, navigator. He ends up as a lot. He ends up as a He ends up as Jomo Kenyatta's doctor, then lawyer, in order. <laughs> and then, last, most important, Johnny Smythe. Is the person who writes a report to London saying that the Empire Windows should be allowed to sail, which is they, the, the the most amazing sort of I don't want to say full circle, but yeah, it, it it is, isn't it? It's just bring bringing bringing things together. But it's also it's that thing where like we spent this time talking about is is this a hidden history? I invite your listeners again to look at the most famous picture of the Empire Windrush of the stern and. The people cheering over the stern of the windrush. Half of them are wearing battle dress. They're wearing dark blue RAF battle dress. Which is like that sort of is. There's not a lot of people coming on windrush to serve in the RAF. There are some, but there are a lot of people with connections to the RAF service. And to that, and in many senses, when the government is looking at why we should let the Windrush in and give it its docking permits and allow that, that generation of immigration for the West Indies to happen, because they haven't really had any problem, it's because, oh, well, the West Indians who served the war built a reputation of themselves as being shit hot. And there are problems. You know, there's a when they bring in a large contingent of ground crewmen, there are a lot of problems there. But I mean, that's because some, they put three thousand to four thousand West Indians in some of the most visible parts of Lancashire you can think of, with a lot of sergeants from colonial service who don't like them, and there are a lot of quite grim incidents. And they're also, they're a lot less motivated than the early volunteers because they're basically signing up for money, not. Well, they're signing up for patriotic duty, but they're not uh, they're not officer class. Yeah. The dan- social dynamics are different. And that is a whole podcast in itself talking about the ground crew. And I actually need to do more research on that because it's very interesting how well, they when, have a much harder time. When you do come back. Mm. And, we'll, and we'll we'll do we'll do that chat. Maybe do it together. We can have a bottle of yeah. something between us. <laughs> Joy. Yeah, because that's I mean, we haven't even gotten into the, well, we haven't gotten into the conflicts with the Americans in many senses, because talking about fighting with the Americans is kind of the easy way out. It's one of those things I didn't put in the notes because that's, it feels that there's an overt bar there with, with, with that relationship and lots of the things that, that went on that I think for the conversation, especially, especially at the moment and, you know, having chats with friends about inward facing nations and, and ever ever larger monuments it, it's those aspects of it that i think there's a a large proportion of people who would like to to look to look back at it in a particular way and that's sort of what what we've been chatting about here that this was a an impressive group especially in the in the on the aircrew side who then went on to do even more incredible things for their own people when they got home yeah and I think, you know, we have, you can't ignore that there were a lot of British people who welcome West Indian airmen and back them in corners and disputes and fights. But there are a lot of British people who don't at every level. And there is a consensus of 45 to repatriate as many, if not all of them as possible, and to get as many, if not all of them, out of the RAF. There's a move to try and bring the Calabar back. And the RAF protects the color bar, and the RAF protects the color bar because they basically turn around to the joint services and go, it wasn't really on any legal study beforehand. How the hell are we going to enforce it? You know it's silly. Don't you? They, this is essentially what the memorandum says. 
in the most racist language you can imagine. But it basically says this whole rule is stupid. But they still want to repatriate as many people as possible. They don't want to maintain a multi-racial service. It's they want to roll the clock back to thirty nine, which is fascinating because it reflects on how everybody's accepting that's not going to happen with the imperial status quo politically and socially. But the army still wants to keep up the appearance that it can just go back to how the world was before. And the RAS, well, the RAS has gone from being an ancillary service in many ways to the primary, to having ends up as the primary strike young British power. It knows it can't go back to how the world was. And I think what they do next is another podcast because it becomes, especially when you start looking at the exchanges and things, it definitely becomes a very, very, I don't want to say multicultural because it wasn't, but a very interesting mixing pot of, of ideas that, that go through it, especially, especially in the 50s and early 60s. Mm. Um, we'll wrap that there, mainly because I know you've not done that bit. <laughs> so I won't, yeah. ask you, I won't ask you that question. But what are you up to, sir? If, if people want to find you, where can they? And of course, we must give a shout out to that fabulous show that Olivia does that she puts up with you on. And you okay. had me on the other So <laughs> people can find me um, wherever they like their tweets at Bad Socialism on Twitter, Blue Sky, all the other places. I've made me tweet about Star Trek. Um, I'm so sorry. I can't, it can't be helped. There's nothing to be sorry about, sir. We wear, wear that affliction with pride as we do our Second World War stuff. Yeah. I do tweet also a lot about my current master's work at KCL, where I'm doing a lot of working a lot with imperial history. It's probably going to get more about my dissertation um, from now on as I try and figure out what it is. But yeah, you can find me there. If you like Star Trek nonsense, I do a podcast called I Quit Star Trek, which is um, a podcast where we take a product we like, Star Trek, and I'm mean to it forever. <laughs> I do that with my dear friend Olivia, and I really recommend it if you're into media analysis that shouldn't be as deep as it actually is. It's a very and, good pod. Yeah, I mean, we've had some great guests on recently, haven't we, Matt? You have had some great guests and some not so good ones, so I do apologize yeah. for my appearance. <laughs> ah, don't slow yourself down. No, it's a very good guest. But yeah, so listen to that. Um, I have other projects and things going on. If you, I'm not going to take time talking about them if you like star trek i do talk about that a lot if you like star trek and history you're in for a big ride otherwise um donate to your local food bank that's it's always a good thing to do and put the bins yes, out sir. that's my fun for tomorrow but john this has been fantastic and i've been thank wanting you. to have you on for a while so thank you so much for it's my pleasure taking some of your wednesday I hope there's some use of material in there. i know I, I went quite rambly and my notes look quite messy now i've been pulling stuff up and Trying to drag him across. It, to be fair, I've been following the sort of the scripty thing that we kind of agreed on before. We kind of followed it, which I think is pretty good for us. Which is did we? Almost. Oh, we yeah. did. We did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. There was a plan, and it was followed. It was executed recently. It was ninety percent successful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, I, on a, I do want to sort of. Slight note about memorializing and sources, which is that a lot of the work I've done, a lot of the, the independent work I've done has been tying a lot of personal accounts and memorial work to the to the, the records. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without the work of people like Mark Johnson and Stephen Bourne, who got to actually speak to a lot of these people before they passed and were able to collate interviews and collect the narratives and corroborate stories that, as a young historian, I simply won't be able to do. So I'm always, you know, I think a lot of people are like, where do you hear this stuff? I'm mean, quite frank, which is that it's people like Stephen Bourne and Mark Johnson who do the legwork on that. And I can only really claim that I've got really interested in what does the official side of the story look like? So I'm beholden to that. But also um, the, the Arnhem reference brought me back to the story of um, Arthur Weeks of Barbados who sort of, Featured in one of the most sort of important visual documents of the West Indian pre Second World War, which is a BBC documentary called West Indies Cooling. It's on the IWM website. I recommend you watch it. 
It's a fascinating document. It's a fascinating run through what the West Indies was involved in in terms of labor and service and contribution. It just runs you through and what, and it's, it's propaganda, but it shows you. And when it talks about the fighter pilots, it talks about us at Weeks with Barbados. And Weeks was, Weeks served in one through two squadron with two other West Indians, um, Collins Joseph and James Joseph Hyde. And all three of them were killed before the end of the war. And Joseph was killed, Alwyn Joseph was killed um, over the years. Joe Hyde is killed in mid-43, I believe. And Arthur Weeks is killed on the last day, second last day of the Battle of Arnhem. He's killed on the 20, I believe the 23rd of September. So I'm right. Um, but I know roughly from the squadron records where he was killed just north of Nijmegen. It's sort of one of these days I will go out and find it. Because it's just this... I can't take credit for knowing, for finding out who these people are, that is, and collating their stories and his work of historians who got to actually talk to them and work with them, the people where they were alive. I think as a young historian, as somebody who started a career, I'm very much like I just want these stories to be continued and for them to form part of the national narrative and not to be seen as individual spots, but more like there is an arc here that fits into Britain's war as you understand it. They're not aberrations, they're part of what happens. I have no idea if that made sense. I like that aberration, but I think that's the bit where we'll we'll let it roll. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Matt. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been an honor to have you on, sir. I've like I said, I've I've been enjoying what you've been doing for a while. Star Trek stuff aside, yeah, that's pretty hit and miss, but <laughs> But thank you so much for joining me. I cannot thank John Conker enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. And I hope you found that conversation enlightening because for me, I had to check myself numerous times throughout it because there was a lot there that we discussed that I hadn't really considered before. I knew a lot of the names and for all of my going on about pilots like Jellicoe Schoon, I was unaware of those burning hoops that so many of them were forced to jump through. Please do go check out John's work. The I Quit Star Trek podcast is fantastic. And please nag him for what he's going to be doing as a dissertation, because I think whatever he produces is going to be fantastic. All the links to his socials are in the description below, along with the Star Trek things that I'm not sure we're allowed to talk about in case the Paramount people are listening. It's really good. I listen to that on my lunchtime walks. So check the description. There is more in there. As ever, thank you so much for your continued support of the podcast. Even when I've got a cold, we're still putting this thing out. Like, subscribe, please leave a review on your podcast app of choice, stick some stars in the algorithms and our AI overlords, who we all welcome. Do listen to these things, apparently, and push these things up at the tables. And this podcast tends to be either in the top 10 of aviation stuff or not. And I don't know why the AIs play with me like that. But there we go. Enough of that. If you would like to become a damn Castier from just £3 a month plus VAT on Patreon, you get stickers. That's right. Stickers and a thank you card from me in my scroll and some other bits and pieces that we're working on at the moment. You get all these episodes early, different intros, outros, and we're going to be doing hopefully more with that to get everybody together as well. There's a link for that in the description below. And of course, I have to thank our fantastic sponsors at the Pima Air and Space Museum, who have a lot coming up, including a drone flying event in the beginning of January. So check all that out. Links in the description below. And we're going to be heading out there in the spring. I can't wait. More details on that soon. So until next time, thank you so much for listening and do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.